Uh, hello, Mr. Jeff. Can you explain the NFT trend? What is your opinion? Oh, shit. <laughs> um, let, let's get back to that because, oh, my God, we fucking... NFT is... Uh, I'm up to my eyeballs in NFT conversations. But let's let's talk about it in a second. Um, what What is... Uh, do I still skate? Yes, yes. Um, well, now that the snow has melted, I will start skating again. I've got a really nice, a couple of nice parks uh, out here. Um, and even though I'm going to be 50 this year, fuck it, I'm still going to skateboard. And I'm still shredding. I'm still tearing it up. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about NFTs. And uh, what I don't want to talk about is the financial shit. What I want to talk about is everything but the financial bit, and it's and it's interesting because, uh, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of arguments happening uh, on Twitter right now about about NFT and and I think if you haven't taken the time to look at the bigger picture of what this means, then then it's hard to have an opinion. You really have to deep dive deep dive into um you really have to deep deep dive into into what that means so here's a perfect example um i just watched two documentaries on netflix and the first one was um about warhol and it was narrated by this woman who as a child her father bought a um a warhol brillo box and he ended up like knowing the gallery owner and somehow got like the box signed by Warhol. And I think the guy spends like $250 for, um, for this box. And it ends up that, you know, the, the box changes hands a bunch of times. And the, the point of the documentary was that the, the now woman was trying to locate like what happened to her box that the father had bought and it sat in their, you know, living room and he had like a plexiglass case over it. And, you know, sh there's photos of her like, you know, laying on it. I mean, it's hilarious. And you can probably see where the story is going is, you know, the, the, the box sells at auction, I think, for $3 million. And so the conversation becomes, well, um, what did Andy Warhol make, you know, um, you know, Warhol made whatever he sold the box for, which was like two hundred and fifty dollars or seven hundred dollars. I, I can't remember what the price was. Don't don't quote me on it. So one interesting aspect of of NFTs is, um, and again, there's so much to talk about and there's so much to tackle. But let's just start with a couple of fundamental ideas. So the first is is that most of these platforms. Um, uh, will give you 10% on secondary sales. So in perpetuity. So that means that for the life of that artwork, as it resells, you as the artist would always make 10% based on secondary sales of that artwork, right? So imagine if Warhol were still alive and he was making you know 10% off of the 3 million that it sold at auction. So it would really guarantee that the the artist matures securely and financially with the secondary sale of that artwork, which is incredible, right? So that alone, I would think that every artist on the planet would want to embrace uh, such a thought. Okay, let's shelve that. Second documentary I watch is uh, on Netflix, and it's about how um, this gallery in New York um, was basically selling fakes it was the Nodler Gallery, which had been in business for, you know, 165 years. And um, it ends up that they had gotten conned and they were selling fake Jackson Pollocks and fake um, Rothko's. So now there's this whole idea of authentication, right? So if you had a Picasso and you wanted to sell that Picasso, you would have to submit that Picasso to a rigorous amount of... Uh, people to actually certify that the thing that you actually owned is actually a Picasso, right? And so the whole point of this documentary was, you know, there was um, one company that kind of blew the lid off of this whole scam, 
which was they were um, identifying some of the paint that was being used in this in this uh, in this Jackson Pollock, and it ends up that there was a yellow that was being used in this painting that wasn't invented until like the seventies, and Pollock died in the fifties or whatever it was. So it you know it was ruled that it was impossible that this this painting was a Jackson Pollock. So the blockchain also does that. So imagine, again, and we're just setting aside all this monetary bullshit right now, and I understand it's fucking crazy. But imagine that, you know, I personally have been making work for 25 years. Imagine I could take my entire catalog of work and put it on the blockchain and say um, that I am the original creator of this work. So in a, in a sense, I'm also authenticating while I'm alive that I am cataloging my entire uh, body of work and um, certifying that, you know, that it's real and that I made it and blah, blah, blah. And that's forever. That's on a completely decentralized network. And so um, what does that mean for my estate, right? So everything that I would put on the blockchain if i were to put my entire cat and again this is like such a crazy conversation to have listen i've been making work since 1995 and and back in 1995 we had sidequest drives and then we got fucking zip drives and then we got like better hard drives and i was constantly trying to figure out how to like catalog and back up my work so I wouldn't lose it because hard drives died. And then I got like raid servers to, to like to catalog my work. And then eventually I spend, I think like $700 a year for Dropbox business so that I could literally put, um, you know, 25 years of, uh, of my work, uh, you know, into the cloud so that I could secure that. Like I would not lose my, my source code. Okay. And we'll get to, Matthew, Matt, we'll, we'll get to the environmental stuff here in a second. Um, so imagine now we have this possibility to uh, put our entire catalog of artwork onto the blockchain. It's decentralized. It is forever. And I'm certifying that I am the creator of that artwork. Just that alone, how does that not fucking change everything for artists, right? So now, as long as everything is, yes, we're going to talk about the environmental stuff for a second. And yes, I've gotten hate, but let's, let's, have, this, let's have this convo. Um, so you put everything as an NFT. You put everything on the blockchain. And as long as it's assigned to this, you know, uh, crypto wallet ID, right? So I've got a crypto wallet ID that I'm securing everything to, means that I can pass that on to my daughter, right? And so now it becomes an issue of my catalog of my life's work. And it also means that I can pass that estate down to my family until the fucking world sets on fire, right? Till the world blows up. And so as long as my daughter still has my crypto ID, she would then continue to get 10% of sales in perpetuity forever, right? And then she could pass it on to her children, so on and so on and so forth. So just, just that alone, how does that not change the entire conversation that we're having? Now, let's talk about the environmental stuff, okay? Um, the, the thing that I find fascinating ab about the environmental stuff is, well, first, let's just say this. Am I concerned about it? Yes. Do I think it's going to get better? Yeah, it's already happening. To, to yell about the environmental impacts of the Ethereum network is, is you, like it would fall on deaf ears. That, you know, the Ethereum has already moved into layer two, a lot of platforms are going to switch from proof of work to proof of stake it means that the environmental stuff is going to have an impact of like 98% better. So to say that, that this isn't happening or that it hasn't happened and that it, it isn't going to get better is just silly, okay? Because it's already occurring. So that's number one. The number two is, is, is that this whole conversation is really generated by two people, 
and I don't want to name them. You know who they are um, if you've done your homework. The whole conversation is happening by two people. And these two people are artists. <laughs> and uh, if you take a second, my biggest problem is, is that this entire conversation is, doesn't provide any context. It doesn't provide any context to anything else that's already in play. So what is context? So the context is, is, is that if you look at a, a graphic designer like myself or, and I'll, I'll name drop Chuck Anderson because he was a good part of this conversation, is, you know, for years we have sold posters, we have sold zines, we have sold t-shirts, okay? And selling posters, t-shirts, and zines means that you are using the energy in your studio to create that work. Then you're having to, let's just talk about posters, okay? Then you're having to take that poster and you're having to tube it up. You're then having to take that poster to the post office. The post office then has to put it on a truck and then that truck is then either going to an airplane to fly to different parts of the world. It may even be going on a boat to sail across oceans to get to other countries. And so when you start to look at those two things, newsflash, NFTs consume less energy than, than all this other shit that we have been doing for the past 25 years. So why are we having this argument? Why are we having this argument about a new thing that is replacing an old thing and the old thing is a worse impact on our ecology? Why are we even having this conversation? The funny thing is, is that, for, let's set aside NFT, the entire Ethereum network uses the same amount of energy as YouTube. NFTs only compromise, uh, uh, are only comprised of 3% of the Ethereum network. Are we fucking yelling at every person who posts a, a fucking cat meme on YouTube about how they're ruining the planet? Context. All of these conversations, they lack context. And can Ethereum get better? Yes. Will it get better? Yes. Is NFT better than all this traditional shit? Yes. So I, so the demonization is fucking killing me. And I'm really trying to wrap my head around why people are so polarized here when clearly uh, NFT is so much better than me having to print out a poster and take it to the post office, put it on a plane, it then gets into a postal car, drives it to your house, and then you then frame it and, and, and put it up on your wall. And then, if we are gonna fucking nitpick, talk to me about the, uh, all the bricks, all the wood that was required to make those post offices, to make those galleries, to do those things. So, if you're gonna nitpick about NFT, then fucking nitpick about all of the energy that is used just to support traditional brick and mortar galleries or, or the brick and mortar post office. The conversation is a joke. It's a joke. And so, so, so what is the, so what are we talking about here? Are we talking about, uh, that these artists are upset that the, the rug has been pulled out of the entire fucking ecosystem do you know how many gallery owners have mailed me in the past 30 days i would imagine that gallery owners right now are losing their fucking minds because now let's look at these platforms most of them take anywhere from 15 to 18 to 20 percent okay traditional gallery it's 50 50 right and again you start getting into things like Let's talk about the ecological impact of fucking Art Basel in Miami, where all these fucking people are getting on planes 
and are flying to Miami. Like, <laughs> like we talk about the ecological impact. Let's just talk about our Basel. Let's just talk about our Basel, right? And so I'm really trying to understand like why people are so upset about the ecological stuff when clearly not only is this environment going to get better and not only does the data suggest that we're going to get to you know it it being even better uh it still is clearly has a better ecological footprint than everything that we have done for the past 25 years, right? So, uh, so is it about, yeah, is it about gatekeepers? I don't know. You know, is it about that the gatekeepers who have told us like what is valuable and what is art and what isn't art? You know, like, are they the ones that are just, like trying to hold on to this? You know, is the music industry going to fucking lose their minds because... Like, just think about the music industry, right? So we've got guys like Blau. Um, we've got, you know, people like this who are trying to bring the music industry into the NFT space. And, you know, Blau's drop um, that he just did, you know, um, for his last release, I think brought in like $11 million, okay? And so you take a step back and you say like, holy shit, like $11 million, that's fucking bonkers. Yeah, but, but, but what, is the, what is the cost for Blau to do a tour and to put all of his equipment on trucks and then ship those trucks like, you know, from state to state to state to state so that you can see them live in whatever fucking state you live in. We want to talk about ecology. Open your fucking eyes. How is this not better than everything that has preceded it? Okay. And so... Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to have this conversation with the people online. And yeah, if people just, they read two articles by two artists and the fuck, they, the sky is falling. Like, you know, like the world, the world is, uh, is losing its mind. And I just think context is important. I think perception is important because I think that this space will get better but I already think it completely supersedes what already exists. Um, so Blau not really bringing the music industry in his face. He's changing the industry by paving the way. Yeah, but his platform that, you know, his, his whole release, the, the, the thing that he's working on with, and I can't remember the group that he's working with, is a platform that every musician could use, Right. Or you have platforms like Audius. Um, I sat on a Clubhouse chat um, with the Audius group the other day and just listened in about how NFTs would, would help the music industry. And, um, you know, I know people, you know, I'm friends with Dead Mouse, and I know people are like really polarized by some of his behavior. But, you know, he, he in a chat not too long ago, he had this like really interesting thought, which was, like, if I can bring the music to my fans and to my people, you know, uh, to people, and and not have to um, do merch tables at concerts, how is that not better? <laughs> I mean, yeah, live music, when we get around to having live music, is still going to be great. You know, I, I love going to shows. But, you know, does that mean that they can get rid of the traditional merchant merch table model um, because NFT will, will help them survive. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting conversation. I might mint these screenshots. Uh, you look epic. <laughs> uh, old man yelling in the wind. <laughs> so yeah, it's evolving fast and, and I think a lot of people are like a little freaked out by what's happening financially. And, and yeah, I mean, I think, oh yeah, thank you. Origin Protocol is the platform that Blau worked with. Yeah, that's great. When you're over on uh, uh yes, it does. Yeah, but I love skateboarding. I, I would much rather talk about skateboarding than NFTs. 
The world needs a Josh Davis energy. Hey, Mark. Man, I, I really uh, hope we can uh, get together soon. I miss you, buddy. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the I'm being very careful about NFT stuff right now. Like, I've only put up, um, like, I think 12 or 13 pieces. Um, I haven't put any of my back catalog up. I'm still waiting to, to, to figure that out. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is great. Loved your stuff since before you had tattoos, I guess. This was sort of for you all day you know it, it it's been a uh that's also been another like really fascinating thing i think for us digital artists because you know we've been told by the art world that what we're making is not art so um you know i remember having a gallery show back in i think 2007 um called tropism and I had written a bunch of programs and I had generated them to vector and they were illustrator files. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to print like 20 of the, you know, 10 of these or 20 of these, the addition is 10 or 20. And, and there was always kind of like this, well, how do I know you're not going to print it again? <laughs> how do I know that you're not going to, you know, you know, print this, this file again? Like how rare is it really? And so for 25 years, I think us digital creators have always, have always struggled with being sort of arm's length uh, with the art world. And, uh, and that, yeah. And when I say digital art, I mean, everybody from Photoshop to illustrator, to generative art, to programming, to cinema, 4D, to whatever. Right. Um, we've all kind of struggled with this, you know, what you're doing is not art. And so for this thing to come along to, um, to help solve that problem, I think is also really interesting. And so, you know, for us creatives, you know, um, you know, we've, we've been, we've been making, you know, digital art, but then we've had to do other things. We've had to do, you know, commercial projects. We've had to do things for, for, you know, <laughs> I was uh, chat video chatting with G monk the other day and we were, we were having this conversation. He's like, if I never have to fucking do a car commercial again. Right. So we've had to like express ourselves creatively, but then we've almost had to like kind of prostitute ourselves in a way to sort of like, hey, I make art, but I'm willing to sacrifice, you know, some of that uh, for your car commercial. <laughs> um, and so for this thing to come on, come along uh, so that we actually can be <laughs> artists, fucking mind blown. 